Thank you for joining the 2020 SureTrust Disability Power 100. While we wait for others to join the celebration, we're going to take a look back at previous events. Yeah, it's amazing. I can't, I can't quite uh, believe that I've ended up being, being number one. It's amazing. It's um, I'm so like really, really proud, and I'm really like grateful to to the panel for for voting me in at number one. I was on the committee for the list a few years ago, and it was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this. And I, I think that it's nice for disabled people to be to be recognised. So I think the power list is hugely important for the next generation because it, it normalises. Disability. It makes us visible and it celebrates the assets that we bring to all walks of life. It's really great to be in a room with so many disabled people that are trying to change things. I think that the power list does more than just say, oh, well done, we know who you are. It kind of says you're all individually in your own way trying to build a better tomorrow. I think the future generation will look at it and go, I can do things, I can go out there and have a opportunity and not play at home. To have influenced people that much that they felt you on the power list Oh, that feels amazing. I think the importance of this list is that people growing up now, that they will be able to see disabled people of all different types, but it doesn't stop you doing things. Disability in the UK, we're very, like, I know we do, do down on ourselves in, in a lot of cases, but we're very lucky that we live in a society that is inclusive and uh, as accessible and allows people to flourish as much as they do. This concept of disability pride, you know, I know that some people kind of find that like a grey area and a murky area, but I definitely have disability pride. Being part of the power list gives me disability pride. These people have influence, these people are out there changing society and perceptions of disability. This publication is totally unique. There's nothing like it anywhere else. And so for sure trust, this is a wonderful thing that we're, we're profiling these people for the leaders of tomorrow to see the great things can be achieved. Thank you. And welcome to the 2020 Sure Trust Disability Power 100 celebration. Congratulations to all of those nominated. It's great to have so many of you here today as we announce our top 10 and reveal the most influential disabled person in Britain today. This event is being recorded and we will be sharing it online. Later in the event, we'll be hosting a panel discussion on the disability glass ceiling and how we can achieve better representation in the media and in boardrooms. During this discussion, we'll be encouraging you to send in your questions using the question and answer feature here on Zoom. We'll also be launching a poll on how the government can best get your views, experiences and recommendations to help formulate the upcoming disability strategy. Throughout the event, we'll be tweeting using the hashtag Disability Power 100. Please join the conversation and we'll share as much content as possible. What we really want to do is see disability power trending on Twitter. Our exceptional number one from 2019 and Chair of Judges, Baroness Jane Campbell, is unfortunately unwell and so she's unable to join us today. We're all wishing her a very safe and speedy recovery. So please welcome Diane Lightfoot, one of Jane's fellow judges and CEO of Business Disability Forum and our chair for today, Diane Lightfoot. Thank you, Alona, and welcome from me to the fifth annual celebration of the UK's most influential disabled people. Thank you to all of us for joining us today. And as Alona said, I had the honour of being one of this year's judges for the Power 100, and I will have the pleasure of announcing the top 10 a little later on. 
as Alona says, um, also, while I'm delighted to be your host, I'm very sorry that I am but a poor substitute for Baroness Jane Campbell and also echo those good wishes for her very speedy recovery. Now, this year is particularly important because it is the 50 year half century anniversary of the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act of 1970. The legislation transformed the lives of millions of disabled people in the UK and worldwide. Social reformer Lord Alf Morris pioneered this first legislation to recognise disabled people's rights in areas as diverse as access, education, employment and mobility. It became the pattern of similar laws enacted throughout the world and in later years it has become known as the Morris Act, the Magna Carta for Disabled People. And I'm sure those of you listening will recognise those areas, access, education, employment and mobility are still very, very current 50 years on. ALF is an important figure in Shore Trust's history through the ALF Morris Fund for Independent Living and his legacy continues with the work of the Disabled Living Foundation, which is part of the Shore Trust group. This year is also the 25th anniversary of the Disability Discri Discrimination Act of 1995 and the 10th anniversary of the Equality Act 2020, so it's a bit of a hat trick of anniversaries. But of course, it's not just about looking back. Next year, uh, in 2021, the government's intention is to set out their national disability strategy, a strategy for disabled people, disabled people's organisations, charities and business to achieve practical change that will remove barriers and increase participation. So during this year's launch, as well as listening, we want you to engage and give us your views on this. And so to help, we are holding a poll for your views on how disabled people can have greater opportunity and a voice to inform government, levelling up opportunity so that everyone can participate in the life of this country. Nothing about us without us. So the poll question is... How can government best gather the views, experiences and recommendations of disabled people to help formulate its disability strategy to make sure lived experience is fed in? Please vote for one option only. You might want all of them, but one only, please, by using the chat facility. And the options are A, surveys, B, a public consultation, C, a disability roadshow traveling to different areas of the country. D, virtual public meetings with ministers and officials. E, focus groups or F, disabled citizens assemblies. And we'll be announcing the results of the poll, your views at the end of this event. Now, shortly, I will be announcing this year's top 10. And after that, there will be an opportunity to join a panel discussion on the topic of the disability glass ceiling. We will be discussing what needs to be done to ensure disabled people have opportunities to progress in their careers and ways in which greater representation can be achieved in the media at C-suite, exec and board level positions. And I will be joined by many panel members uh, and influencers from the disability space. But now I would like to hand over to Chris Luck, CEO of the Shore Trust, who is going to speak about why Shore Trust produces the Power 100. Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, may I first also wish Baroness Campbell a swift recovery. Um, we need her. My thanks to Diane for her introduction and for stepping in as our panel chair for today at short notice, um, as well, of course, as being one of our judges. My thanks also to our independent judges for their commitment and time in making all of this possible. It does give me great pride to lead an organisation that is passionate about ensuring all talent has a voice and is celebrated. The Powerless 100 helped Shore Trust drive positive change as an organization committed to building a future where rewarding employment is accessible to all, including the many disabled people we support on our programs. 
our power list showcases the great achievements of disabled people at the very top of their game across major sectors of our economy and society. We will hear what it means to be on the power list from previous finalists shortly, which is all the validation we could wish for. However, as well as celebrating the great achievements of our finalists every year, Shore Trust produces the Power 100 so as to directly inspire the future talented leaders of tomorrow. We all need role models to be inspired by. As you've already heard, today we celebrate the fifth annual Power List in the 50th anniversary year of the first disability legislation, Alf Morris's 1970 Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. Legislation was a vital step forward. However, underlying inequality and discrimination remains embedded. It is being further exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis. We are therefore pleased to see that the government will publish a cross-government disability strategy next year. It is vital that it takes a holistic, joined up approach to tackling disability, discrimination and inequality, grounded in the social model of disability. In particular, the government must take decisive action to reduce and ultimately eliminate the disability employment gap. This has remained stubbornly static at around 30% for over a decade and looks set to widen because of the impact of the pandemic. Incredibly, even before the COVID crisis, at the rate of progress in recent years, just halving the disability employment gap could take 200 years. And I, it's, bare, it's worth repeating, 200 years. So the government strategy needs to join up departments to look at all potential barriers to employment, from social care, transport, accessibility, to housing and benefits. So next week, the government is launching an insight gathering phase to inform their strategy and does want everybody to promote participation through social media channels. We will be sharing details and informing Cabinet Office of our own poll result. Back to today. I'm looking forward to our panel discussion on how disabled people can break through the career glass ceilings. So one more important step before we announce our wonderful winners. A recorded message from our chairman, Sir Ken Elisa. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here, albeit virtually, to celebrate this year's Shore Trust Power 100. As chair of Shore Trust and one of the initiators of the Power 100, I wanted to share with you why I think it is so important. Let me start by restating the criteria for inclusion. Every one of the list's members is an influencer who's made a positive difference to our country. Unfortunately, in the age of social media, the term influencer has taken on a whole new meaning. So to be clear, I'm not talking about weirdly dressed exhibitionists promoting dog food or perfume. I'm talking about people who have overcome the tough realities of their circumstances to achieve their goals and in so doing, have opened up opportunities for other disabled people. I'm talking about role models, men and women whose achievements have confounded negative attitudes towards disability and have improved and are continuing to improve inclusivity in our country. Inclusion is important as a matter of social justice against which it's hard to argue. Someone's future should not be determined by their past, it should depend on their talents, their aspirations and their willingness to contribute to the greater good. But as a businessman, I find that while assertions like that are invariably met with nodding acquiescence, they don't seem to trigger substantive action. However, I have discovered a way of explaining the blindingly obvious that does attract the attention of those with their hands on the levers of power, whether in business, the third sector or government. And that way of explaining is to point out that although social justice is important, it's only one side of a coin, and the other side is competitive advantage. Whether you are in business, not-for-profit or government, you are, by definition, competing with others for revenues, resources or votes. And if you don't empathise, understand your principal stakeholders, 
choose from a list which includes customers, suppliers, staff, recruits, funders, regulators and voters, you will inevitably lose out to those of your competitors who do. By showcasing 100 of the most influential disabled people in the UK, I hope that Sure Trust will send out four very important messages. One, to disabled people across the country, see how these inspirational role models have overcome the tough realities of their lives to achieve remarkable things. And take heart, it is possible. Two, to businesses and not-for-profits, there is a deep but still untapped pool of talent available to you. That pool contains people who can improve your organization's performance as well as giving you deep insights into the universe of your stakeholders. And three, to governments, local and national. The Shore Trust Power 100 is but the tip of a massive iceberg of accomplished and engaged citizens. Ignore them at your peril. But today, of course, the fourth and most important message of all is one of loud congratulations to our winners. 100 superb role models who, by challenging attitudes to disability and confounding the sceptics and the ignorant, are making this country, of which we are all so proud, an even better place, adding to our national competitive advantage. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you to Shore Trust Chair of Trustees, Sir Kenneth Elisa. I know Ken was disappointed he couldn't actually be with us today. Um, he has official duties as the Queen's representative in London. Um, hopefully, those of you attending uh, are able to see that we have an interpreter on screen and we also have, have captioning. Um, so if you do need any support or additional, um, you are able to get this captioned. We are now going to hear from two of our outstanding power listers from 2019. One of this year's judges, Justin Levine, and Suzanne Ball, on what it means to be a power lister. Hi, my name is Justin Levine. In 2019, I was number eight on the Shore Trust Power 100 disability list. It was quite a surprise. Um, it came completely out of the blue because, to be honest, I hadn't actually heard of the power list before. Um, and so when I came through with the nomination and heard that I was in the top eight, it, it was a big shock. I didn't feel like it truly was deserved for me, but when I got to the event on the evening, I found out that that was a feeling that everyone had shared. Everyone was looking at the incredible work that the other nominees had done. So I think the primary reason why I was nominated was due to a global news piece uh, which came out in 2017. Um, of me crawling through Luton Airport when my wheelchair had been lost. That I went to the papers with a year after I'd been campaigning to try and have self-propelled wheelchairs in the airport. And after the airport had refused to do this, that is when I realised that I had to take it public to try and force the change. Um, I believe this is the primary reason for my nomination. That coupled with the work I've been doing in Moldova, um, mentoring some of the country's orphans and young disabled children. So following on from Luton, one of the most important lessons I learned is that there's, there's quite a big divide in the public between what they think is appropriate for those with an impairment and what is actually happening for people with an impairment in terms of equipment and um, provisions. And I really want to try and see the, the conversation move forward. I want to improve uh, the education, improve the awareness. For me, sport was an integral part of my life, even before I became paralysed. And it was once I left hospital that I realised sport was going to be the best thing to try and help me get more independence and to really build up my confidence after I left hospital. And so one thing which I really want to see is to try and have more inclusive sport, not just dedicated events for people with an impairment, but something where everyone can be doing things together, whether that is a park run or whether it is a golfing event or playing wheelchair basketball with able-bodied and disabled alike. That's what I really want to see starting to improve in the country, to have more inclusion and everyone joining them together. Yeah, I think it's fantastic to be part of an organisation such as the Shore Trust and to be involved in the power list, not just from the nomination and to be in the event, but also since then to try and be involved in all of the activities which you have going and all of the uh, projects to try and help with disabled people and to try and improve the different projects which are happening in the country. I think it's a fantastic thing to be networking with all of the other people on the power list as well. It's really important to bring us together so that our minds can work on the projects for the future. So congratulations on being the Power List. 
how did it feel when you found out you'd been nominated? I was really pleased when I found out that I'd been um, nominated for the Power 100 list because I think it's important to profile disabled people and show other disabled people and general members of the public um, that we uh, have the right to achieve and the right to live our lives in the way that we want to. Um, I set up Attitude is Everything in 2000 um, because there were many disabled people that I knew that were a bit fed up of um, being treated like second class citizens as fans and also as artists and as employees as well. So I set about creating uh, this organisation um, to champion uh, disabled people's rights. Um, have you seen much uptake in the light in the years that you've been working on it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I first started working on it, it was just me and my support worker, so it was quite lonely, really. We had a steering group of about seven or eight people like helping us, and we had a set of ten venues that initially signed up, and ten volunteers, ten deaf and disabled people who became our mystery shoppers, and now we've got 668 mystery shoppers. I'm also very, working very hard with um, Creative United. This is relatively a new position um, for me to have taken. I'm, I'm nearly a year into it and I'm looking at how I can make the creative industries and creative arts businesses as a whole more accessible to disabled people. Um, and also I'm still disability sector champion so I'd still want to be giving a good message out there that um, disabled people have a value and an economic value as well as um, a, a social and a moral value as well. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I'd just like to add thank you so much again for um, nominating me for um, Power 100. It, it does give you um, a personal boost and it's really nice to be recognised. But it's also really nice to go to the House of Lords and see a lot of the peers that you're nominated with who also do great things. Um, I'm really um, pleased as well obviously to see the people that I nominated there um, which I think is really great for them and really great for me because it means I can kind of have a really positive influence over a list like that and say look I know of some great disabled people that are doing stuff and I couldn't do my work without them and that's the thing with with all of this whether you're nominated for the list or not there are loads of disabled people doing great things all working together all working in partnership sharing their knowledge and I think that's really important. And now the moment, or quite a few moments, that you have all been waiting for, uh, the announcement of our top 10. Now, those of you who were with us at the actual event last year may remember that I did the top 10 countdown in the style of Top of the Pops. And so this year, although we are remote, I will once again be attempting to channel my inner Bruno Brooks as we go into this year's top 10. If you don't know who Bruno Brooks is, then you're a young person and you're very lucky. If you don't know who, what Top of the Pops is, then that's a whole nother conversation. Um, unfortunately, that means that I can't give you a certificate if you're in the top 10, and I certainly can't shake your hand or even bump elbows. But before I start, my sincere congratulations to everyone who is in the top 10. We had an incredible range of entries and it was an incredibly difficult task as judges to, to decide on who was going to make the cut. So huge congratulations to everyone in the top 100 and particularly our top 10. So without further ado straight in to not only our top 10 but our top 100 at number 10 it's Cameron Malik. Cameron is a campaigner for equality and a dedicated advocate for the user-led disabled people's movement. Born in Pakistan, he was interested in sharing ideas with disabled people around the world and learning the lessons of lived experience in different cultures and structures. Cameron has represented the UK disability movement at the UN and has forged links with the Global Disability Innovation Hub, which was born out of the Paralympic Games in London 2012. 
As Chief Executive for Action on Disability for 13 years, Cameron arranged a new purpose-built home for the organisation, created an inclusive youth service and bridged the divide between big businesses and young disabled adults, setting up supported internships with companies such as GSK and L'Oreal. In 2017, he became the CEO of Disability Rights UK, the only UK-wide disabled people's organisation. Cameron has been working to increase diversity at Disability Rights UK and is determined to support the sector to diversify and to appreciate intersectionality. Congratulations, Cameron. Now, next, new to the top 10, but not to the power 100. At number nine, it's Sophie Morgan. Sophie is an award-winning disability advocate and social entrepreneur who has reported on current affairs programs such as Dispatches and Unreported World, as well as live para sports events on Channel 4. She has a passion for travel and is a mentor for Can-Am's women's programme, ambassador for Include Travel and regularly writes for Condé Nast Traveller and Sunday Times Travel. Sophie is global ambassador for women's rights and inclusive education for Leonard Cheshire on the special advisory committee for Human Rights Watch and patron of Scope and Backup. She is also working alongside disability rights lawyer Chris Fry to launch the Disability Passport in 2021. And if that wasn't enough, Sophie's debut book will be published next spring. Congratulations, Sophie, at number nine. And next, straight in at number eight, it's Shrin Madipali. Formerly a corporate lawyer at a leading international firm in the City of London and achieving an MBA from Oxford University, Shrin has become a leading figure and expert in the world of technology and accessibility. Shrin was CEO and co-founder of Accommable, an accessibility-focused travel platform, when it was acquired by Airbnb in 2017. The acquisition received media coverage around the world and marked the first time a disability-focused company was acquired by a mainstream technology company. Shrin is now an active investor and startup mentor in the UK technology sector. He mentors at several incubators and accelerator programs such as the Oxford Foundry and the Creative Destruction Lab. That sounds interesting. In 2019, Shrin's achievements were recognised by St Peter's College, Oxford University, who unveiled his portrait in its Hall of Notable Alumni. If that wasn't enough, other recent accolades include being awarded the Trailblazer for Inclusion Prize by the New York-based National Business and Disability Council and being declared Innovator of the Year by the California Foundation for Independent Living Centres. Congratulations, Shrin. And next, there are no non-movers in this list, uh, which is a shame because that's, that's a very good thing to be able to say in my top of the pops mode. So instead, new to the top 10, but not to the power 100, and coming in at number seven is Gavin Harding, MBE. Since the 1990s, Gavin has been advocating for the rights of people with learning disabilities and autism driven by his own experience of assessment and treatment units. In 2011, Gavin made history as the first person in the UK with a learning disability to be elected a local councillor. Four years later, he made national news as the first UK mayor with a learning disability. Gavin also works for NHS England and was recently promoted to Senior Learning Disability Advisor, the first person with learning disabilities to achieve a senior management role in NHS England. 
Gavin strives to embed reasonable adjustment policies. In NHS England, he has made huge differences to how people with autism or learning difficulties are recruited and supported. Co-leading on quality assurance, he runs focus groups for inpatients at secure units and sits on Yorkshire and Humber Transforming Care Executive Board, working with colleagues in NHS Wales and NHS Scotland to share best practice. Honoured with an MBE in 2014, Gavin won a Learning Disability and Autism Award in 2018. Gavin's life story, in his own words, was featured in a book made possible by Saba Salman, which was published this year. Congratulations, Gavin. And moving on, also new to the top 10, but not to the Power 100, at number six is Shani Danda. Shani is a social entrepreneur, disability equality advocate, and business and culture change agent. Passionate about representation, in just the last 12 months, Shani has been the face of LinkedIn's first ever mainstream digital and social TV ad. She's also starred in a Netflix series, Nadia's Time to Eat, with former Great British Bake Off winner Nadia Hussain. And she was also crowned the Greater Birmingham Chamber's Future Face of 2020 for her work as a social entrepreneur and campaigner. As an award-winning disability specialist and speaker, Shani has worked with companies including Virgin Media, Google, Viacom, and LinkedIn. She helps organizations break barriers and integrate inclusion into their business frameworks. As a subject matter expert, Shani brings the voices of disabled people and their organizations to policy development for the government's Office for Disability Issues. Shani's style and approach are described as a winning combination of authenticity and passion helping to remove the awkwardness and fear of having confident conversations about disability within business and society. Congratulations, Shani. Right, we're into our top five now, so things are really hotting up. So next, and straight in at this year's number five, it's Simon Minty. A trainer, consultant, and public speaker, Simon has focused on disability since the early 2000s. Based in London, his work is international with many clients from small non-governmental organizations to multinational corporations. Simon's creative side has helped improve the portrayal of disabled people in media with the BBC, Channel 4, Warner Television, and Endemol Shine. In 1999, he won Best Television Feature for his Channel 4 travelogue documentary in China. Since 2018, Simon has been a non-executive director of Motability Operations PLC and a trustee of Improbable Theatre and Stopgap Dance. He is an ambassador to the Business Disability Forum, which I can tell you is an excellent organisation and co-created the Disability Media Alliance project in California. He also co-hosts two podcasts, BBC Ouch, and The Way We Roll with Minty and Friend. He's also the founder of Abnormally Funny People, and I can assure you they are abnormally funny. In 2016, GQ named Simon as one of the 100 best connected men in the UK. And in his own words, Simon says, I do like being me. I wouldn't have taken this path if I'd not been short. I love the people I've met and the things I've done. Being short has opened more doors than it has closed. Congratulations, Simon, this year's number five. Now, number four, um, new to the top 10, but again, not new to the Power 100. At number four, it's Jonathan Andrews. Jonathan is a solicitor who is changing the way disabled employees are recruited, represented and managed. 
He is a committee member of Reed Smith's International Disability Network, as well as helping found the first ever alumni initiatives at his old comprehensive. Jonathan speaks to thousands of school students about social mobility and advocates for young disabled people, particularly around education, employment and mental health. Jonathan also challenges better representation and visibility for LGBT plus people in the business and disabled communities. Last year, Jonathan won the Diversity and Inclusion Award at the Lexis Nexus Awards, the first individual to win what is usually a firm wide category, and was elected chair of the Commonwealth Children and Youth Disability Network, the first official disability youth network to achieve accreditation, and he represented the network at a reception with the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall at the 2020 Commonwealth Day. This year has not stopped Jonathan. He has judged the Law Society Diversity Access Scheme and the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Competition, was selected as a 2020 local leader by the Franco-British Council and was highly commended as a neurodiverse achiever of the year 2020 by Genius Within. Congratulations, Jonathan. Now, if those weren't enough for you, here is our top three. So at number three, new to our top 10, but definitely not new to our Power 100, is Samantha Renk. Samantha is an actress, presenter, speaker, writer, and disability rights campaigner. Her national TV credits include How to Be Aging, I need to look at that one, Celebrity Antiques Road Trip, Sunday Morning Live, Rip Off Britain, Loose Women, Good Morning Britain and Jeremy Vine on Five. She has also appeared on BBC Radio, 4 Talk Radio, ITV News, Channel 4 News, Channel 5 News, Sky News and BBC Radio 5 Live. Samantha is a columnist for The Metro as well as having written for The Huffington Post and Possibility magazine. She also featured in the highly successful series of adverts for Maltesers based on real life experiences of disabled people. Those were great adverts. She is an experienced speaker, having spoken at events for companies and organizations such as the National Education Union, Viacom, Houses of Parliament, the British Red Cross and ASOS. Samantha is an ambassador for Scope and a patron of Head to Head Theatre and was named in previous Power 100 lists in 2018 and 2019. She has also been nominated as Campaigner of the Year at the 2019 European Diversity Awards and Celebrity of the Year Award at the National Diversity Awards 2020. And now, at number two, up three from last year's number five in our second from top spot, we have Caroline Casey. Caroline is the leading force and founder of the Valuable 500 campaign. She wants 500 national and multinational private sector corporations to put disability on their business leadership agendas. And she's moving mountains to make it happen. And she's almost done it. Valuable 500 is about leadership accountability and elevating disability to board level. She's in mid campaign right now and wants to get 500 CEOs to sign up. I think last time we spoke, we were approaching 400. So this is really no mean feat. When Caroline found out she had a disability, she chose to hide it. And with research citing that 7% of CEOs have lived experience of disability, but the fact that four out of five are hiding it, this is something Caroline relates to and is passionate about changing. In Caroline's own words, we are 1.3 billion consumers, suppliers, employees, and members of the community. We are valuable. We are a market a source of innovation, an under-recognized resource. Congratulations, Caroline. And now the moment we really have been waiting for, this year's number one 
influencer. And this year's winner is a new entry straight in at our coveted number one spot, and it's Nikki Fox. Nikki Fox is the BBC's disability correspondent reporting on the issues affecting disabled people today. Never doing particularly well at school due to not knowing she had dyslexia, Nikki gained enough qualifications to study music at university. Not long after her degree, she worked as a telephone answerer for a BBC local radio station. Gaining more confidence after doing a few pieces on air, Nikki applied for a TV training program with Channel 4, starting out as a runner and working her way up to assistant producer on Gok One's How to Look Good Naked. That's definitely one I think it's better to be behind the camera for. More work as a TV producer, five radio documentaries, debt, unemployment, in no particular order later, Nikki finally landed a job at the BBC and in 2014 started working as the BBC's disability correspondent. In 2015, Nikki joined the presenting team for the BBC's flagship consumer rights programme, Watchdog. She continues to work alongside her mate, Matt Allwright, on the show, which is now on The One Show. Throughout the pandemic, Nikki and the team have worked tirelessly to cover the many coronavirus issues impacting disabled people, such as social care, the BMI and NICE guidelines, and a series looking at how the new measures to keep us all safe have caused difficulties for so many people with all kinds of disabilities. So huge congratulations to Nikki in a number one spot, highly deserved and a real, real achievement. And um, I'm pleased to say that although Baroness Jane Campbell is not able to be with us today, she did catch up with Nikki to find out what it's like to be a number one influencer. And you can see them here. Hey! Hello, Nikki. Jane. Mm -hmm. This is exciting. I'm it's so honestly, it's my greatest pleasure to virtually award you the 2020 most influential disabled person on this year's power list. Number one. Oh, number one. No way. Yes. Jane. Yes, it was. It was an absolute unanimous um, vote from the British public that you this year have done one of the most influential jobs that disabled people can do. As you know, it's been a really difficult year for disabled people. And we want to give you this award because you have done sterling work out there on the BBC, actually shining a bright light on some of the issues that we disabled people faced throughout the pandemic. The, namely, keeping and making sure that our rights were protected throughout this time. So this is a very worthy award and I'm so pleased to hand it over to you. As you know, Last year I was number one and after a hundred years of campaigning <laughs> and uh, quite rightly so, you know, I I should get it at the end before I go into retirement and start knitting and uh, doing all the things that I dream of. But um, I think it's time that I handed it over to you and good luck with this award. We're expecting even more great things <laughs> from you uh, the rest of this year and in the future. So oh, well done. Jane, honestly, the fact that, one, you had this last year, you know how much I adore you. And also throughout this period, this terribly difficult period, you've been wonderful. Well, I've taken up a lot of your time, really, <laughs> Jane. Well, it's been very joyful. Oh, shall, um, we tell, shall we tell the audience that most of that time is talking about how our hair 
Yeah, 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 a lot, a lot. It's very important to disabled people to how we look virtually. Virtually, and also when we can, where we're going to go for some cocktails. Absolutely, and yeah. thirdly, oh yes, disability rights—they're quite important too. But you have, I mean, honestly, I know the stories that we've I've spoken to you about whether you've been part of that story or just helped me with all of the information beforehand. You know, I, I do adore you and I'm really feeling a little bit emotional because this does actually mean quite a lot because, you know, I, I obviously have got my role as a correspondent and um, for me, it feels like I'm just doing a job, but also I know the importance of it and um, I know what a difficult time this is at the moment for so many disabled people in pretty much every walk of life and I feel that responsibility and I think from March the 16th I don't think we stopped and when I say we I must mention because obviously it's my mug on the camera all the time but James met the people that I work with you know I've had the founding members of Team D, Team Disabled, uh, Ruth, Ruth Clegg and David Cheeseman who does all the camera work, Ruth's a brilliant brilliant super producer, I've also worked with a wonderful producer called Michaela Howard for a couple of years and other shoot edits at the Northern Bureau but I just have to mention them because they they work so hard and you don't see all the work that they do because like I say it's this on the screen but really it's a lot of hard work by a lot of other people who are also just as passionate about disability um, as I am but I do yeah I, 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 I've got to get it together and look a little bit wild but um I do really this is like honestly like definitely one of the biggest honours of my life I have ranted on to Jane a lot about how I feel like, am I good enough am I doing enough mm. I do take my job very seriously and the responsibility that I have and you know the fact that that we are covering disability stories and I just want to always get it right and always do enough and I do right and did that sort of stuff does keep me awake at night so to get this just makes you know just makes me feel really good <laughs> and I'm really hugely 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 honoured really I am and to get it from you Jane and whenever I obviously you know because now I'm going to say oh you know to my PAs could you do the splints of the most powerful disabled please <laughs> Of course. Um, you, um, could, you, could you make a coffee for the most powerful disabled people? But I'm always going to follow that with Jane got it last year. Travis <laughs> Campbell got it last year because everybody knows how just phenomenal you are and have been for years. And I, I cannot tell you how much I love you. It's a little bit weird, but you know I do, Jane Campbell. And I admire you so, so much. So the fact I've got it from you makes it even more special. Well, I think what we can both agree on is that we are nothing without the amazing re resilience and determination and campaigning zeal of hundreds of disabled people across the country. Yeah. And you talk about teams, you know, we can only do what we do because it is a collective effort and disability rights were only gained by the collective effort of hundreds of disabled people across this country. Yeah. And I think what I really learnt this year, more than any time in my activist career, is how bloody resilient, am I allowed to say that online, so how bloody resilient disabled people are and their determination to survive and to help others in, in their own situation has been phenomenal on social media, on the news, in the, uh, on the, uh, in letters to Parliament, yeah, in yeah. every aspect of life, you will find disabled people are campaigning um, hard and shouting, nothing about them without us, and also, you know, we are here and we're not going to be treated any differently to anybody else. You know, mm -hmm. We are people with rights mm -hmm. and it's been phenomenal this year. So I'd like to pay tribute to the disabled people who helped me to carry on fighting from this little road in, in lockdown, which has been 
keeping me going, frankly. So, yeah. So, good or strong. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. Here is the award. And go forth. Oh, plenty more stories to do, Jane Campbell. Oh, God. I'm going to be hitting you up on Zoom with the DDA coming up now. Oh, I've got all the day. Anyway, thank you. Honestly, this Bye. is so Thank you. An absolutely outstanding winner. Congratulations, Nikki. Nikki had hoped to join us today for our panel discussion, but unfortunately she got in touch a little bit earlier to let us know she's not feeling very well. Um, I'm sure you'll all send your best wishes for her swift recovery. And I know she is following the event on Twitter and hopefully watching us live. Um, we are now going to move on to our panel discussion on the disability glass ceiling and how we can achieve better representation in the media and in boardrooms. Please remember you can ask any questions using the question and answer feature available on Zoom. So over to our chair, Diane Lightfoot. Thank you, Alona. Um, it's my great pleasure to chair this very illustrious panel. Um, I'm very sorry that Nikki isn't able to be with us this afternoon and congratulations again Nikki it's it was great to see your interview with Baroness Campbell um talk about two inspirational people um but we do have two of our top 10 indeed top five in the shape of Caroline Casey this year's number two and Simon Minty this year's number five plus Claire Gray, who would be on the list if she wasn't one of the judges, because we, I think we all agreed that that was probably a poor show. Um, Claire is the organizational lead for disability advocacy at the Shore Trust. Now, as Alona said, please do ask your questions, pop them in the Q&A, and they'll be fed through um, for our panel to answer. Um, but I'm gonna kick off with a few of my own. And so firstly, to, to Simon and Caroline, what does being in the pop, top 10 and indeed the top five of the power list mean to you? And I am gonna pick on Simon first. Uh, thank you, Diane. Thank you for everybody. Uh, Suzanne Ball said it is, it kind of gives you a little personal boost, doesn't it? Um, before I go on, big get well, Jane, and get well, Nikki. I don't want to forget that bit because those two are just amazing. Uh, when it popped up, I think it got to seven or eight. I was watching it and got to eight and seven. And I thought, well, OK, this year is not going to happen because they're amazing. Because Shreen and then the person after that. And then it came up at five and I swore it was quite a loud swear word and went, oh, OK. So, yeah, it's a lovely surprise. Thank you. Uh, amazing. Well, very well deserved. Congratulations, Simon. And Caroline, what does it mean to you? I, I actually genuinely am speechless, which is not <laughs> usual for Caroline Casey. <laughs> um, you know something, it, it really means a lot. Uh, it means a lot because of the people that we are all in company with and people I really admire people who've been the hands on my back um, and encouraged me. Um, the road to <laughs> this audacious thing of radically transforming the business system through CEOs sometimes feels incredibly lonely. And um, this is like somebody saying thank you and thank you for not giving up. And it actually means a huge amount to me to be recognized with the peers that I respect so much. And I just want to say get well the incredible Nikki and Jane, um, and, and to everybody, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you to you, um, and thank you to everyone on our Power 100 list and all the other people who aren't on the list doing amazing things because there are far more than 100. Um, so uh, the next thing I wanted to ask you is, what one best piece of advice would you offer to a disabled person looking to develop their careers and particularly to step up into a senior position? And I think I'll, I'll start with Claire on that one. 
Ah, oh, thank you, Diane. No light put me on the spot, is there, straight away? <laughs> I'll come to the others after, Claire. I mean, I can swap it about <laughs> if you prefer. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, um, I would say utilise your networks. You know, I, I, as a disabled person myself, I was never really given any careers advice when I was at school because they just didn't think I was going to work. So there wasn't any point. But what I would say to people now is, you know, explore your options, talk to people that work in the sectors, get their advice. You know, social media these days are, is so great to reach out to people that you maybe not have direct contact with. So use those networks, use social media, tweet people. You know, they can't ignore you. They have to reply. So you can get it, get to people that you wouldn't be able to and ask their advice about ways in which they they could advise you about ways in which you could advance your career you know um use your own personal networks as well because sometimes we just don't tap into the people that we have contact with and they're a great resource good advice thank you claire caroline what would your bit of advice be well considering i'm not employable <laughs> i'm not <laughs> sure there, i'm not sure how not sure about that advice. Um, three very quick things. The same advice I would give somebody who has a lived experience of disability or not. It's what you want to do. Um, and finding that way to your path, not what other people think that you can do, but what it is that you want to do. You may have to do a, a particular shitty job on the way there. The second one I think is don't make my mistake. I tried to achieve to despite my disability, against my disability. And actually, I think that I, I really lost out um, because now I dance with my vision impairment. And I, I speak to that as a place of tenacity and resource and solutions. So don't fight it try to find the best way to frame what it is that you have. That's the extra piece. And very lastly, will you just ask for a bit of help every now and again and don't make the same mistake I did. I, I thought that my, I thought that the biggest thing I could do wrong was to ask for help. It's the biggest thing that I can do right. And I learned that every day. And that is not about weakness. That is about impairment. I have an ancillary question for you, for you Caroline, before I come to Simon, uh, which is, I want to know where those amazing earrings came from. <laughs> Not disability related, but I love them. That's from uh, one of our Well, no, so these earrings are because um, I was trying to look for something purple to celebrate everybody on the list, not thinking I would be in number two or whatever. <laughs> and everybody knows that I like, I'm a magpie, I like sparkly wings, but I can't wear the wings on my back. So I thought I'd wear purple stars to say congratulations to everyone. Thank you. And Simon, what's your what's your piece of advice? I'm glad Caroline did more than one because I'm the same. Uh, but I'm with Claire in the networking bit. And and I'd add to say do the sort of what I call soft and hard. So there's the stuff. Give me some help or give me some advice or let me talk to you. And there's also a soft bit where you meet someone, there's something memorable. So remind them about that. I think there was someone I sent some coffee. They'd mentioned they missed this coffee. And I did it, and that just makes you memorable. It makes people think, okay, you're in there, uh, in their head. Um, I taking on Caroline's mention about hiding uh, disability, and I think most of us have done that at some point. Uh, I don't want to overstate this, but I do think the world is changing a little bit. And I mentioned this at the forums uh, event last week. Black Lives Matter, uh, Me Too, uh, We Shall Not Be Removed, the Disabled Arts. I'm feeling that lots of boards and organizations are saying, and young people are saying, we're fed up of waiting. There's a real impatience. And there always used to be a kind of avoidance. And now I think this is a golden time. So be confident around your impairment. I think this, or your disability, this is a, a bonus now, if you've got everything else with it. My last comment, uh, since I turned 50, suddenly these senior roles came. So be patient. Um, so I made it into two. Now, when I have an interview, you go to an interview and they ask you questions and they talk about your CV. When we get into the, the non-exec role or the national theatre, I turn up and they say, OK, ask us questions. 
and I have to do it. And it suddenly spins around. And so it's, what are you going to bring to the board? What are the challenging questions you're going to think about? So it used to be, I'd sit there and just answer all the right questions. It's spun now. So whatever you do, prepare and have some really brilliant questions in your back pocket to open that up. Because then that shows that you're a critical thinker or you're going to bring something to the board. Thank you, Simon. And obviously we can't believe that you're 50. Not possible. <laughs> Dorian Gray, Simon. Dorian, Dorian Gray. Gray, yeah. There's a portrait in that attic. There sure is. Um, okay, some questions in the chat. One from Brendan. If there is one thing you would like us to do differently as advocates for ourselves and our community in the community, what would it be? Who fancies that one? Say that question one more time. Mm. If there's one thing you would like us to do differently as advocates for ourselves and our community, right. what would it be? I thought you were volunteering then, Simon. I, I can give it a go. Uh, go on, then. It, it was a regret that I made a mistake of. We've already talked about don't hide the impairment, but you know, you don't have to slam it in the face, just be clever about it. Uh, I think it's about don't get too hung up sometimes. I, I had a role with Channel 4 many moons ago. And I suddenly got funny and I thought, oh, I'm the token one. And is this a proper job? And I got over techy and I got over political and I left and I regret it. I lost a friend out of it. And I don't know, maybe my career, maybe I'll be a commissioning editor at Channel 4 now. Now, you know, that's the way it goes. But uh, I've spoken to other people in certain roles and this is a role that you know will bring them some reward and they get very frustrated while they're in there thinking, why am I doing this? So being an advocate, something just uh, see if you can hang on. Don't forget your disability politics, but make sure you don't cut off your nose to spite your face. I love that. <laughs> I'm going to say um, drop the defensiveness. Um, I think that's something I've, I've had to learn as I've grown up. Uh, I think I can really relate to you, Simon. But if there's one thing that I would do is, um, and I encourage us all to do is, I wanna give up my seat for a younger generation person. I am so excited <laughs> about this generation that are coming. And uh, I'm being given so many opportunities and platforms. And I think what I would love, and I am doing it now and I'm loving it is I'm gonna, I'm going to give my seat to somebody else with all my backing and support. Thank you. And Claire, anything you want to add? Well, I would just reiterate what Simon and Caroline are saying, really. I think um, disabled people are not, you know, shouty enough. We don't shout about what we have got. You know, we're, we can tend to be quite defensive. Um, because that's that's our resilience that we've had to develop over the years. And actually, as we all know, you know, we've got great skills. You know, I never knew how great I was at project planning because I just do it instinctively because that's how I organize my day. You know, I have to think about everything. And actually, as I've said during this pandemic, um, non-disabled people are getting a bit of an insight now to what disabled people experience on a daily basis, you know, and uh, it's great for us to see them having to think about the things that we have to think about generally, so we can help them now, because actually, yeah, we can say, do you know what, we do this all the time, so come and listen to us, so I would say, for future generations, you know, let's pass on our advice to younger people and say, we need to be loud and proud like other diversity groups and, and not be shameful. It's part of our identity, you know, like our, our gender, our ethnicity, and we need to be proud about it. And why wouldn't we? Because we've got great skills to give. You certainly have. And that whole piece around identity is something that comes up a lot. Um, Claire, you mentioned... You, you kind of nearly mentioned the C word, by which I, of course, mean COVID. And one of the questions in the chat, sorry about that, is how is COVID going to impact on us breaking glass ceilings? Well, I think Simon touched on it before. I think COVID actually is, in some ways, going to create more of an equal platform because we're not going to have to travel the country like before you know there are more opportunities 
for people to do things virtually, but also recognizing that virtual isn't the answer for everybody, but at least it brings a greater mix into the situation. And I think now with, as Simon said earlier, with Black Lives Matter and Me Too movement, there is a new recognition about how diversity is so important to organizations. And I really think, you know, from Sure Trust point of view, we've had some um, really great organizations contact us and ask for help now about how they can have a more diverse talent pool. Um, and we never had those questions come through, not in terms of disability um, before, but we are now, people are beginning to reach out because they are seeing the benefits of that, you know, in terms of the products, the customers, you know, if you look, if you work in a diverse way, it benefits the organization. So I think COVID, the big C, is a big wake up call to everybody. Um, and I, you know, I just hope that although people see that, you know, COVID has is very, very worrying time, there will be benefits from it and we'll capture those benefits and replicate them for the future. That's what I hope. And I'm certainly heartened by some of the conversations that I'm having and the real passion um, from so many people across so many sectors to say, no, this is, this is important. This is something that we need to do now. Um, a question in the chat. Um, what advice would you give to staff at all levels to support the aims and needs of any colleagues uh, with a disability? And um, Simon, would you like to start us off on that one? Yeah, good question. First off, it's, you know, is it relevant? So I don't want you to go up to your colleague and go, oh, why aren't you on the Power 100 list? You've got a disability or something inappropriate. I think there's, a, there's always a time and a place. The smart bit is if there is a difficulty, you can have a conversation and say, how can we help? But maybe because we're talking about power and we're talking about glass ceilings, maybe it's more sophisticated and we should be talking about, are you, could you be a mentor? Could you be a coach? Could you be someone who starts saying, look, there are opportunities and I think you should go for that. So you're, you're building up confidence. Uh, one of the things I've started doing in the last five, six years is a career development course for staff who have disabilities and organizations. And unpacking all those sort of blocks and the, the, the difficulties that we can sometimes bring on ourselves is amazing. So if you're a colleague and you can unpack whatever the, the, the blocker is for the individual and then help them spring forward. I just want to make sure you, you do it appropriately. So yeah, be careful. Thank you. And um, another question I wanted to ask, and I think I might I come to Caroline first on this one. If you could go back and change a work or career decision you took, what would it be and why? Oh, um, I think the very first decision that I made in my professional life that I would change, but it's hard because it, it's got me to here. Um, I really wish that I had owned the full extent of myself um, and not hidden the fact that I had a vision impairment in Accenture. Um, I, I really look back on that. It was an inflection moment in my life um, where I, when I consciously discriminated against my own identity and against the global family to which I belong. Um, now, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here, but I, I, do, I do consider that I, I wasted a lot of time trying to be somebody else or giving power to the physical disability that is just as much part of me. Um, and the second thing I deeply regret, uh, which was a few years ago, I went against my gut instinct on something and listened to other people because I had lost my confidence and I cannot express enough to everybody. Never, ever, ever, ever ignore your gut instinct. It is the most powerful asset that we have. It may not make sense to other people, but it will always serve you well. And if I had listened to that gut instinct, I would like to think the Valuable 500 would have been born three years ago, three years earlier than it was. 
I would entirely endorse that about gut instincts. Every time I've ignored mine, it has um, bitten me on the proverbial. But anyway, yeah. uh, let's come to Claire then. Same question, actually. If you could change a work or career decision you took, what would it be and why? And then I'll ask Simon too. And then I'll come on to some of the questions in the chat. When I first started thinking like that I wanted to work within ICT, so I spent four years studying uh, a, a computing and information systems degree, which in hindsight um, actually was, uh, I could have spent four years doing something else. But really, to be honest, I don't regret any of my decisions. And I don't really think that I would change anything because everything I, uh, I have done in the past has given me knowledge and experience, which brings me into my current role. Um, so I don't regret anything. Um, I, I do regret that I wasn't given the advice and support that I should have been given as a, as a disabled person. I regret that and I hope that changes for the future. I think um, there are many young disabled people um, and people with other challenges at the moment that aren't getting the careers advice. Um, and I would hope that that can improve. But um, no, I'm I'm happy with what where I've landed. I've got to say that because Chris Luck, our CEO, is possibly <laughs> listening, so I have to say that. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I'm very happy with my life. I'm very happy with where I'm at in my life. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't had those experiences. Very true. And that's that thing, isn't there, about you shouldn't regret anything that you've done, only what you haven't. Uh, Simon, any any um, thoughts from you on that one? Yeah, you just took the words exactly out of my mouth. Oh, sorry. Uh, because, no, really no, not at all. No, not because that's exactly the point. And only I've already talked to my, my, my Channel 4 mistake. And, you know, 25 years later, it nags me. It does nag me mm. um, as much as the friendship as anything else. But um, I'm going to spin it and do the... Uh, National Theatre, I just heard through the grapevine, someone who lives in London, someone likes theatre. Now, if I'd really thought about it, I wouldn't have gone for it because it's terrifying. I So, OK, here's another bit which links to that. I think sometimes you see 10 job criteria or that panel and they need these five skills. I think if you've got three of them, go for it. If you've got one of them, maybe it's a bit of a stretch. But don't think you've got to have all five of them. And I think we might knock ourselves back. So I'm very much of the go, be confident. I've realized belatedly that everything I've done has generally taken me out of my comfort zone. And I don't know why. And then I realize oh, that's because it's enjoyable. It makes me feel alive. It makes me feel scared. I could slip back into safety if I wanted to but I don't because then I'd miss it. So it is about the things that you say no to that you regret more than the things that you say yes to and have a little bit of gumption, you know, take a chance. And all of that is just really good experience. And, and can Very I also say, Diane, I think the one thing is not to, to allow ourselves to be defined by those mistakes and just be a little compassionate <laughs> to ourselves about the things that we screw up in because everybody does. You don't need to have a disability for that. So I think a little self-kindness every now and again is a really good thing. Definitely, very wise words. We definitely will screw up. Um, okay, so a question in the chat from Rachel. Rachel asked, how do people get involved with Disability Power 100 to help people with autism? And um, I, I do know, Rachel, that there are people in the Power 100 um, who have autism. And indeed, number four, Jonathan Andrews, I first met um, because he had come through the Ambitious About Autism um, Exchange Programme. Um, and as you see, he's now a very successful solicitor at Reed Smith. Um, but I guess raising awareness um, of amazing things that people are doing is, is one way of engaging. But um, Claire, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just like to say that you it's the the power list is um, publicly nominated. So um, we can only profile who the public nominates. And, you know, from one of the coordinators and organizers of the, the power list, I would just say, please, you know, help us to share and promote the power list, the people on it. Um, so that we can get a more of a diverse range of people with skills and abilities 
on to that list because it's only by doing that that we can profile the great work that people are doing so it's up to the public we don't have any control unfortunately but um you know there are great people with all different types of impairments from all different sectors that haven't made it onto the list this, this year um, and we recognize that and we want to change it. We want to make it better each year. And we can only do that by the help of everybody to make sure that those people are nominated and get through to that judging panel. Yes, absolutely. So, so get nominating for next year. And I think we're going to be sharing um, after this how you can do that. Um, a question for Simon from James Moore, which is... Congrats on being in the top 10. What do you think we can do to push media companies, execs and casting directors to include disabled actors on our screens and keep to quotas, he's put? So there's possibly two questions in there. Uh, I think there is stuff happening more than ever. So you'll take old timers like me and Matt Fraser and Liz Carr and been around forever doing this stuff. There's a load more, so sorry for those I've forgotten. Uh, and already I can see in 20 years, there are a lot more visible people. I can name them on one, two hands now, where it used to be just two fingers or something like that. What I'm liking is the writing behind the scenes is getting better. So I think we can write brilliantly as well and do write those scenes. They used to do lots of events and I'm always half and half, you know, where you bring the writers together with the, our talent, but things do come out of that. So uh, I think more writing, writing ourselves, also, any tiny little opportunity. I remember meeting Nikki Fox at the Soho Theatre. We were doing Abnormally Funny People. And it was a horrible time. It was like midnight and she was exhausted. We were doing the comedy. And I, we had a little chat. And, and I remember saying to her, oh, my God, this is really bleak. And she said, yeah, and it's going to be shown at 6 o'clock in the morning. And it's, we we're all like, oh, really moany. Now look at her. It's fabulous. So, okay there are little bits that you can do that will lead to greater things but just keep pushing and there's fabulous people like Jack Thorne who's a writer who's doing more around disability and our, our lines what's the word our stories are becoming more interesting and more available I haven't given you a, a simple answer there but I think just keep chipping away keep chipping away that's good advice um a question oh, quotas quote yes quotas I don't know how I feel about that. So early days, never do quotas, sends all the wrong signals, doesn't work. Occasionally now, I kind of think, well, should we have one? Should we just make them do it for a bit? Or do we? Do they get in trouble if they don't do it? What's the consequence? So I'm a little bit of me is going towards it, but I know that brings problems. And that's a whole, that's, a, that's a yeah. probably a very, a very big subject for, the, I think we've got about six minutes left on our panel discussion. Um, so if we run out of questions, I'll come back to you on that, Simon. Um, but a question from Tom is, how do you deal with a setback that doesn't feel fair? Caroline looks like you're having a moment with that one. I Go on. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think this is a really, this is an interesting one. Um, and I think actually sometimes this is why today and is lovely <laughs> because um, certainly I think every one of us who tries to do something different, part of it is failure and setbacks and you get better at setbacks, okay? You get better with practice. The one thing I can give from my own experience and I can only speak to myself is try not take the setback personally. And I, and I, and I mean that because I, I think I've taken a lot of my failures and my setbacks personally. And it depends on where I have been in my life journey or in my head or having done the work that I've done. But when I take things personally and too emotionally, and I love my emotions, so I'm not apologizing for my emotion. It's one of my great little, it's in my medicine bag of tools. But when I depersonalize things, I get to a solution quicker. I see the opportunity and lesson out of it. So I do think that's the greatest learning I've had about setbacks. See it as the opportunity to learn. I know that's a cliche, but it's there, but it's must to try not take it personally. Thank you. And Simon, did you want to? I, I, yeah, it was, um, 
uh, it's about support networks. And I, like all of us, have had those times where it's just so miserable or you're so deflated. Uh, um, so, yes, I have the counsellor, I've had mentors, uh, I have family, I have friends, I have very good disabled people who bring me back to earth. And if you're like, well, I haven't got that, but you've got a list of 100 of them now. Mm -hmm. And I would tap a few of them up and say... Yeah you know, can you be part of my, my gang or my, my back? Because you need those people to let it all out and excuse the cliche, be authentic and just let it fly. And then they can build you back up and you can go again. And you think of Jane Campbell and Nikki Fox, they both just pushed themselves up. And that's so lovely to see where they just both love each other and it you know, makes you rise a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Question here from Maria. We haven't got much time left, so probably just come to one of you. What would you say to a non-disabled person who wants to understand more about your dis disability but is worried about saying the wrong thing? Claire, did you I'm open for questions. <laughs> I think it's open, look, open, for me, don't we have to, I don't know what Claire and Simon say, but I would prefer somebody asks and it is up to me to try and make the space for them to feel comfortable to ask. So I'd rather they ask than not, because when we don't talk about things, things become a problem. That, that is my invitation. I would totally agree with Caroline. Um, I would also feel much happier people ask. You know, it's important that people feel comfortable to ask questions. Um, you know, I have people stumble around saying, oh, Claire, you use a, a, you in a, a, and I think, just say it, I, ha I use a wheelchair, you know, that's fine, I'd rather you just say it, please, you know, because now you're making me feel uncomfortable, so, um, yeah, I would say, totally agree with Caroline, please just ask the question. <laughs> okay, and we, we I mean, I can see we're running out of time and the questions are coming in thick and fast, um, so I'm going to, one one question for Claire, and then I'm going to ask one final question to all of you. So a uh, question for Claire um, around intersectionality and also when to use the politics or the Equality Act or legal routes to combat rigid views and discrimination. Well, that's a really nice light one to end on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll give you a light one after this. <laughs> Like I'll try my best to answer that in a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> I, um, again, intersectionality is important these days. We don't need to carve, you know, put ourselves into compartments. We're everything. You know, we are not just male, female, disabled, non-disabled. You know, our identity is our identity, and that's made up of many parts. So intersectionality is vitally important that we recognize all our attributes, not just one. Um, and hopefully that comes through on the, the power list. Um, but also, you know, for the future, you know, with, with legislation, it is a challenge. It's difficult for everybody to get legislation enforced. And I would say sometimes these organizations or people that are maybe um, not practicing the legislation, just sometimes need to be reminded that it's there, you know, I, and, and action could be taken. A 30 second add on. I had a client and I was doing training and they said, look, we've not much time. Could you drop the law a bit? And I said, no, I'm not ready to do that because it isn't the thing that I lead in. And it's not the thing that's the main point. But too many people spent too long to try and get the rights put into place. And also I want people to say, this is what you could do. And this is the best way of doing it by the way, you kind of got to think about it as well. So that's all I just need to know is remembering that is backing up other things that we might say. So I'm with you, Claire, that little reminder mm -hmm. from time to time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, I, I'll get into trouble if I don't close soon, but I wanted to ask you all in probably one sentence each, um, who is your role model and why that's come through on the chat? And I think you're all banned from saying um, Baroness Campbell or Nikki Fox, because that's cheating. So... <laughs> <laughs> who is your role model and why? Uh, uh, who wants to go first? Don't mind. Go on then, Simon. 
Uh, it's obviously you, Diane. Uh, uh, <laughs> but if uh, that gets me another question, Thank doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Ellie Simmons is after Jane Campbell and Nikki. Ellie Simmons, um, the Paralympian. I spoke to her recently. How you can be what she is and come through all of what she's done and just be the nicest, warmest, most genuine human being. And she has made my life easier because short people get a little less attention because of Ellie Simmons and what she's done. So she's kind of carried the can for me. So yeah, I adore her. Thank you, Simon. That's lovely. Uh, Claire, who's, who's yours and why? Well, my role model was um, Professor Mike Oliver because actually development of the social model changed my life because I was a bit like Caroline and probably Simon tried to hide it. You can't very well hide a wheelchair, but um, I tried my best. Um, I didn't want to be involved in the disability community as a youngster growing up, but actually thinking about it in a completely different way and seeing it from a social model perspective that is other people's problem, not mine, made me feel able to do the job that I do today. So my role model is Mike Oliver. Brilliant, thank you, Claire and Caroline. I find it very hard to only ever have one of anything, meaning I genuinely, a role model for me is somebody who has fallen down and got up again, is completely themselves. And I am lucky enough to be surrounded by incredible people in my life, but I'm gonna choose one particular person because I love the way he speaks. And I feel that I have wings when he speaks and that's Eddie Nadobu. Um, and I, I just think he's a rare, precious uh, human on the planet at the moment. And uh, yeah, thank you. That's that's it. Thank you, thank you all for coming up with such brilliant role models um, because you didn't know I was going to ask you that because it came up in the chat and so uh, I have to draw that to a close I think we could chat for much longer but a huge huge thank you to our panelists Simon Caroline and Claire thank you for being fabulous and now I think it's time for me to hand over to you Claire for the results of our poll yeah thank you Diane we've had a fantastic response so the top answer from our survey is the, the most popular for how disabled people can, um, can have greater voice and greater input into the disability strategy is virtual meetings with ministers at 28%. Um, then we've had um, disabled citizens assemblies at 22%. We've had um, Ratios at 13%, surveys 10% and public consultations 10%. So we're going to keep this survey going. Um, we're going to make it available so that people can also um, input into the feedback. We're going to give this to the Cabinet Office for them as well to take on board when they're consulting about the strategy. So thank you for everybody's um, views today. I'm now going to hand over to Chris Luck, our CEO, um, who's going to say a few closing words for us. Claire, uh, thank you. And thank you all for a, uh, a wonderful and thought provoking uh, panel discussion. Uh, and Claire, you, you mentioned me earlier. Uh, all I'm going to say is uh, you've never actually been afraid of telling me what to think. And uh, thank goodness for that, too. Um, in closing for Shore Trust and the Powerlist 100, may I first thank those many behind the scenes who made today happen. I'm sure you're all feeling relieved uh, and hopefully proud too. And to all of you, of course, for sharing this celebration today. A celebration where, um, as a non-disabled person, the insight, the insight offered and is just a glimpse, I know, into the, in, into the lived experience is humbling. Um, bloody resilient, as a great lady recently said, is certainly a takeaway. I do congratulate Nikki Fox, uh, but of course, all the 100 listed individuals. My sincere apologies that we haven't announced everyone on air. And of course, all those many more nominated. The list does go from strength to strength, and the quality of nom nominations is exceptional, but we want to reach further into the hinterland of those talented individuals that are making a difference in this space. So please do 
cascade this and 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 really push for their names to be nominated and renominated. Um, I think it's really important. Uh, my thanks again to our independent judges, many top influencers themselves in the past. Um, but I will say we have already received feedback on driving more inclusivity into these awards. We'll package that feedback and then we will feed that to next year's independent judges, and they are independent, for their consideration. But thank you for all those inputs already received. Please do go to our Disability Power webpage um, at disabilitypower100.com. More details will be available online for full details of the 2020 list. We will continue to showcase the awards throughout the year with winners from across the 100 being showcased. Um, we also will be contacting influencers this week to confirm who wants hard copies of the Power 100 book, um, not just for shelfware, but hopefully for friends and families uh, and more widely. So plans for next year are already being made and your nominations for the 2021 list will be open from the 3rd of December uh, to coincide with the United Nations International Day of Disabled Persons 2020. Remember, please, that when the event closes today, there will be a survey available for your feedback, which we welcome. Um, I look forward, we look forward to seeing everybody and our future influences in 2021. For now, take care and thank you from all of us at Shaw Trust. <laughs>